Hello again and welcome to your chapter 5 lecture series where we're going to talk about section 5.2 on connective tissue, our cells in a supportive matrix. And here are the learning objectives we hope to achieve through this lecture. So first we need to discuss the characteristics of connective tissue. All connective tissue are going to share three basic components, cells, protein fibers, and ground substance. So first, when we think about the cells, we have classes of connective tissues that are going to have specific cell types, depending on if it is bone, it'll have bone cells. If it's cartilage, it'll have cartilage cells. If it is blood, it will have blood cells and so forth. And most of the cells are not in direct contact with each other. So like this photo here, you can see that these cells are kind of spread apart from one another. And there's going to be two classes of cells. Either they will be resonant cells and stay within the tissue, or they will be wandering cells and they are able to move throughout the body. So first we'll start off in discussing resonant cells. These are stationary and housed within the connective tissue. They're going to be there to support and maintain and repair any extracellular matrix that needs repairing. And examples of resonant cells would be like fibroblasts, which are pictured over here. And these fibroblasts are going to be these flat cells with tapered ends. Most, they're going to be the most abundant cell within connective tissue proper, which in the following slides I'll discuss what constitutes connective tissue proper. And they are going to produce fibers and ground substance of the extracellular matrix. Hence, they are maintaining, supporting, and doing repair, right? Just as we said resident cells do. And down here, we can see an example of our adipocytes or fat cells. These, gonna, these are going to appear in a small cluster in some types of connective tissue proper. And we have special adipose connective tissue in that are found in dominant areas in large clusters. Other resonant cells would be like our mesenchymal cells. You could see them pictured over here. They do have these spider leg type extensions to them, and we're gonna find them uh, serving as embryonic stem cells. So I always say that mesenchymal cells are kind of like your inner five-year-old that believes they could be anything they want. If you want to be a fireman, if you want to be a doctor, if you want to be a unicorn that farts rainbows and sprinkles, then you can be that. That's what our mesenchymal cells do. And what they're going to do is divide to replace damaged cells. One replaces mesenchymal cells. Others will become committed to a specific cell type. Another resonant cell that we have are fixed macrophages. So notice the word fixed. That means they're stationary and resident. They are going to stay within this tissue. So we see this over here. And they're going to be relatively large. They're irregular shaped cells. And they're derived from a blood cell, specifically a white blood cell, that is a monocyte we'll see that they'll be dispersed throughout the matrix. And these macrophages are able to phagocyte, meaning that, excuse me, phagocytize, meaning that they're able to eat other cells or engulf damaged cells or pathogens. They're also going to be able to release chemicals that stimulate our immune system and attract wandering cells so that they can join the immune system attack if they have found an abnormal pathogen. And our wandering cells are going to move throughout our connective tissue. They serve as components within our immune system. Basically, they're wandering around looking for foreign invaders. They'll also help to repair damaged extracellular matrix. And examples of this would be like our leukocytes, our white blood cells. And they will help to protect our body from harmful agents. So examples of these cells would be like our mast cells, which is pictured over here. These are going to be small, and they are mobile cells that are close to our blood vessels. And they're able to secrete heparin in order to inhibit blood clotting. And the dots that you are seeing here are representative of the histamine that they can also secrete in order to dilate blood vessels. 
Another wandering cell type would be our plasma cells. Plasma cells form from B lymphocytes or B cells when they become activated after being exposed to a foreign pathogen or foreign type of material. And what these plasma cells do is produce antibodies. Antibodies are going to be proteins that immobilize foreign material in a number of different ways that we'll discuss once we get into our immune system chapter. Some more wandering cells here for you. We have our free macrophages. These are going to be mobile cells that are phagocytic, just like the fixed macrophages. And the only difference is that they are able to move between different tissues. Now, maybe your eye already went to this video down here. This is depicting a white blood cell or a leukocyte. Notice how it is chasing after that bacteria cell until it finally will capture it and engulf it. There it goes. And there's the bacteria cell inside so that this white blood cell can phagocytize and essentially kill that bacteria. So an example of a white blood cell that does that is our neutrophil. And another cell that is going to be a wandering cell is our T lymphocytes or T cells. And they are going to attack foreign materials as well, such as abnormal cells or cancer cells or virus infected cells. Now let's move on to protein fibers. We said that was an important characteristic of our connective tissue. And the three important protein fibers we have are collagen fibers, reticular fibers, and elastic fibers. Our collagen fibers are pictured in the pink here. And also in this histology slide, you could see that they are like this bubblegum pink strands over here as well. These are going to be unbranched cable-like long fibers, and they're numerous in areas such as our tendons and ligaments. Our reticular fibers, you're only going to find in specific types of connective tissue, but you could see these black thin strands over here are representative of them, and they're gonna be similar to our collagen fibers, but you can see how they are noticeably thinner than those collagen fibers and they're going to be abundant in stroma of some of our organs. The tissue that we most likely turn to in order to see these reticular fibers are within our lymph node, and we have to use specific types of staining in order to see them well. So they're almost always going to be in this black color due to the stain that we use. And then the last fiber type are elastic fibers, and they're represented by the thin purple lines. I'm trying to find them. Oh, they're like a almost brownish purple in this illustration here. But you can see that they are very thin as well. They're created by a protein called elastin. And over here, they're going to be the dark purple lines in this histology slide. These thin purple lines. Uh, they are going to be able to stretch and recoil easily, and we can find them in areas such as our skin and the walls of our arteries. And lastly, the main component of our connective tissue is our ground substance. So this is almost like the background of what everything else is placed within. It is a non-cellular material produced by the connective tissue cells, such as our fibroblasts, and it is resonant of our connective tissues, the resonance of our connective tissue cells and the protein fibers. So all of this other stuff that we've discussed lives within it. The consistency is going to be viscous, for example, like within our blood, or it could be semi-solid, like within our cartilage, or it could be completely solid, such as in our bone. So our ground sub substance is really going to change depending on what type of tissue we have. And when we add that ground substance with these protein fibers, then that is what makes up our extracellular matrix, meaning the contents which we find outside of our fibroblast cell, for example, or our osteocyte cell or our chondrocyte cell. So in our ground substance, what do we have if we don't have fibers and cells making it up? Instead, we have the non-cellular material here, 
And I tried to make this as clear as possible, but it was difficult to find an illustration that encompassed everything. So here is going to be, I'm going to start with our proteoglycan actually. This is a proteoglycan aggregate and we are going to have our other components on the inside. So if you look right over here, these purple dashes are representing our glycosaminoglycan or GAG or GAGs. This is going to be a large molecule in our ground substance and the charge of this attracts cations and water is going to follow that. And then we have our proteoglycan, which is going to consist of all of this region. So here's another proteoglycan, here's another proteoglycan. So this is formed with the GAG linked to a protein. A 90% carbohydrate is in the form of the GAGs. And then we have our glycoproteins, which are going to be proteins with carbohydrates attached. So we have different types of glycoproteins. One of them is fibronectin, in which will help to bond our connective tissue cells. So in this case, we have a chondrocyte and the fibers to our ground substance. So now we have a little bit of a clinical view here of scurvy. Collagen is going to be an important protein and it really helps to strengthen and support almost all body tissues. And to have healthy collagen fibers, we need vitamin C. And so if we have a vitamin C deficiency, people tend to have scurvy. The symptoms would be weakness, we can have gum ulceration, which you see pictured over here, hemorrhages, and abnormal bone growth. It, it is caused by nutritional deficiencies. So the best way to treat this is by consuming foods high in vitamin C. Now let's discuss some of the functions of connective tissue. They're going to be able to provide physical protection, support and structural framework, binding of structures, storage, transport, and immune protection. So as we go through the different types of connective tissues, you'll see these functions come into play. So before we get into some of the more um, common connective tissue types, I wanted to talk about embryonic connective tissue. We have our mesenchyme type of connective tissue, which consists of our mesenchymal cells, and this is going to be the source of all other connective cells. Remember, these cells can become any type of cell they want, and our adult connective tissue often has mesenchymal stem cells. And then we have our mucous connective tissue, and this is really found only in the umbilical cord. So here's a really um, full view of the umbilical cord, and then here is a view that is a little closer up in which you can see the two umbilical arteries and the umbilical vein, and between these three structures, that's where that mucous connective tissue is going to be found. And if we wanna see what that tissue looks like, here it is. We have our mesenchymal cells over here, and we've got some collagen fibers in the light pink. And these mesenchymal cells, they are like stars, right? So they have these cell processes that stick out from them. And let's do another clinical view here on Marfan syndrome. This is a rare genetic disease of connective tissue, and it's gonna cause skeletal, cardiovascular, and visual abnormalities. We are gonna see that through this genetic change, we have an abnormal chromosome, number 15, and the symptoms that someone will have with this is abnormally long fingers, toes, and limbs. So you could see that in this image over here and this illustration and also malformations of the thoracic cage and vertebral column. You could see in this mnemonic over here that one of the common symptoms is scoliosis in which we're gonna have a lateral curvature of the spine and we'll have easily dislocated joints resulting from weak ligaments, tendons, and joint capsules. There will be weaknesses in aorta and abnormal heart valves, which usually leads to to the death of people suffering from this syndrome, and also slipped lens of the eye. 
Another thing we um, I forgot to mention is when we have malformation of the thoracic cage, you can have that thoracic cage almost become concave, and this is called pectus excavatum. And then if it is bowed out, then it is called pectus carinatum. And often people with the syndrome are going to die before the age of 50 due to those cardiovascular problems that we mentioned. And early diagnosis and medical management allows for a longer lifespan. Now let's jump into connective tissue classification. We've got our three main classifications, connective tissue proper that I mentioned earlier, supporting connective tissues, and fluid connective tissues. So we are going to start off by discussing the loose connective tissue where we'll have fewer fibers and more ground substance. And here we are, like we said, we are going to have fewer cells and protein fibers than in our dense connective tissue, which we'll discuss in just a moment. In our loose connective tissue here, we're going to have protein fibers that are sparse and irregularly arranged. We'll have abundant ground substance, and this is going to serve as our body's packing material to help support structures. So we have three different types of loose connective tissue, areolar, adipose, and reticular. So we'll take a look at our areolar connective tissue first. We have this kind of loose organization. I mean, this just looks like it's in disarray, filled with collagen fibers and those thin purple elastic fibers. And this type of tissue is highly vascularized. We're going to contain all fixed and wandering cells of connective tissue proper, and our ground substance is abundant and viscous here. We're going to find this in areas like our papillary layer of our dermis that serves as our second layer in our skin. We'll also find it within our subcutaneous layer and surrounding um, organs, nerves, muscle cells, and blood vessels. Our adipose connective tissue is commonly referred to as fat, and it's going to be composed mostly of our adipose sites. And you might not have known that we actually have two different types of fat. We have our white fat, which is pictured over here, and this is used to store energy and act as an insulator and cushions our body or certain structures in our body. And we have brown fat, which is mostly going to be found in newborns, and it helps to generate heat. And we tend to lose our brown fat as we age. And then our adipose gain and loss is going to be due to our adipose sites enlarging or shrinking. You could see that these cells have the yellow inside of them representing the fat, and they are storing that fat so much so that it pushes their nucleus off to the side. So an easy way to tell if you have fat, whoops, if you have um, fat or adipose connective tissue is by looking at these cells and looking for a nucleus pushed off to the side. So here is another example of that. And before I move on to reticular connective tissue, this adipose tissue is typically confused with the simple squamous epithelium that create our air sacs, our alveoli. So what you want to do is for those alveoli, look for more cells that serve the lung, whereas in our adipose tissue, you're only going to have this, the adipose sites here. And now for our reticular connective tissue. We're going to have a meshwork of those reticular fibers, the dark black lines that we see here, and also the fibroblasts, which are our principal cell here. So he could, here could be one of our fibroblasts. And it'll be, serve as our structural framework for a lot of our lymphatic organs. Our spleen, thymus, those lymph nodes that I mentioned where we're going to typically go to find reticular con connective tissue and within our bone marrow. Now let's move on to our dense connective tissue where we're going to have more fibers and less ground substance. So it makes sense that we call this dense because we have more fibers creating that density. 
we'll see within our dense connective tissue that our collagen fibers are going to predominate. And we have three categories. We have our dense, regular connective tissue, dense, irregular connective tissue, and our dense, elastic connective tissue. So our dense, regular connective tissue have these tightly packed parallel collagen fibers. I mean, look how neat this looks, just all in a row. They can have this waveform to it or just be straight across. And they resemble stacked lasagna noodles. In, we're going to find them in tendons and ligaments. And stress typically applied in a single direction will be indicative of having this tissue present there. We'll have few blood vessels. So if we do have some type of injury that occurs, then it's going to take a longer time for them to heal. Now for our dense irregular connective tissue, you'll see that there are clumps of collagen fibers extending in all different directions. I mean, it just looks like you took that beautiful regular connective tissue and just swirled it around and made it a mess. And this type of irregular connective tissue is going to provide support and resistance to stress in multiple directions. That's why we have this collagen moving in all directions. So we're going to find this in areas such as in the dermis of our skin, our periosteum of our bone, which is a tissue that surrounds our actual bone, our perichondrium of cartilage, which is a tissue that surrounds our cartilage, and capsules around our internal organs. Now for our elastic connective tissue, we'll see that this tissue is branching and densely packed with these elastic fibers. Again, we're going to look for the dark purple in here that serves as our elastic fibers. Over here, it almost looks black. And this type of tissue is able to stretch and recoil. So we're going to find this in the walls of our large arteries. For instance, this histology slide was taken from the aorta so you could see all the elastic fibers here in the aorta we'll also find it in the trachea and our vocal cords now let's move on to our supporting connective tissues starting with cartilage and this is going to be made up of a semi-solid matrix we have in our cartilage, a firm semi-solid extracellular matrix here, and we'll have a collage of elastic protein fibers. Our cell type here in cartilage is going to be our chondrocytes. So chondro means cartilage, site means cell. These are our mature cartilage cells, and they're going to occupy small spaces called lacuna. So I always say that our chondrocytes live within a lacuna. So the lacuna is kind of like their house, and this is the chondrocyte, the pink in the center, and that darker purple color in the center is serving as its nucleus. You'll also see that we have a lacuna for our bone cells that we'll discuss shortly. And surrounded by a uh, dense irregular connective tissue covering that is called a perichondrium. So you can see the perichondrium over here as well as down here. This is our outer fibrous layer and on the inside we see that we have an inner cellular layer. Our cartilage is going to be stronger and more resilient than other types of connective tissue. We'll also see that it is more flexible than bone and in areas of our body that need support that have to withstand deformation. So for ex example, we have the tip of our nose, and it's going to be avascular in its mature state, meaning that we're going to have the nutrients diffuse from tissue that surrounds it. And we have three types of cartilage. We have our hyaline cartilage, in which we will have a clear-looking ground substance, our fibrocartilage will have densely layered cartilage, um, excuse me, collagen fibers, and we'll see that the cells are more flattened and they're organized into rows. And lastly, we have elastic cartilage, which we will have that visible elastic fiber within its matrix. So first we'll take a look at hyaline cartilage. 
This is the most common type of cartilage within our body. Like we said, they will have this clear, glassy type of matrix, and it'll be surrounded by a perichondrium, which I don't have pictured here, but remember back to this illustration, that perichondrium is just going to surround the actual cartilage tissue. And we're going to find this in areas such as our nose, the trachea, and larynx, our costal cartilages that connect the ribs to the sternum, the articular ends of our long bones, which stop uh, friction from taking place and having bone-on-bone -bone contact, and also most of our fetal skeleton. That is going to serve as a foundation for us to go through something called endochondral ossification, which we'll discuss in our skeletal system chapter. Now on to our fibrocartilage. This is going to be our weight-bearing cartilage and will help resist compression. The protein fibers here are in irregular bundles between the chondrocytes. So you could see them in the light pink and dark pink here in these histology slides. But here they've used a little bit of a different staining technique. And so we could see these darker blues are serving as the collagen fibers. We'll also have sparse ground substance here and no perichondrium present. We'll find this really only in these areas and nowhere else. So in those intervertebral discs that sit between the vertebral bodies, that pubic symphysis that, remember, is only going to open up a little bit in women who are in labor, and then the menisci of the knee joint that helps cushion the femur on the tibia. Now for our last cartilage, our elastic cartilage, this is going to be flexible and a springy type of cartilage. We're, we'll see that we have numerous and densely packed elastic fibers here. So you can see it in the black in this histology slide and in the very dark purple over here. And here is a more magnetized view of a histology slide of elastic cartilage where those elastic fibers are in the dark purple. And the chondrocytes we'll see are closely packed together. So here's one, here's another one, and we have several over here as well. And this uh, histology slide more than the others, reminds me that the way that I identify cartilage tissue is by looking for those chondrocytes. They look like little eyeballs just looking at me. So if you look at some of the other ones, they too look like eyeballs. So that is a quick little way that you can tell, oh, this is cartilage tissue. And the areas where we're going to find, um, oh, we skipped over that the elastic cartilage are also going to have perichondrium, and the areas we will find them in is our external ear, so those flaps that you can touch, and some of you can wiggle your ears, um, and also within the epiglottis that we would find in the larynx. Now let's move on to our next supporting connective tissue, our bone, and we're gonna see that bone has a solid matrix. So it'll be more solid than cartilage. It's going to be a greater support, but less flexible. We'll have some organic components, which will be our collagen and glycoproteins. And our inorganic components will be our calcium salts. Our special cells in this connective tissue will be our bone cells or osteocytes. They're going to be housed in special spaces in the extracellular matrix called lacuna. So again, our osteocytes are going to live in their house, the lacuna, just like the chondrocytes lived in their lacuna. And we have two different types of bone. We have compact bone that is more dense, and then we have spongy bone, which is going to have almost irregular plates hitting one another, which is called trabecula. So let's compare and contrast these comp, uh, types of bones, starting with compact bone. It's going to be perforated by neurovascular canals, and that's what we're seeing over here, this darkened portion. This is a special canal that has blood vessels and nerves and even lymphatic vessels passing through. We're going to see in compact bone, we have these cylindrical structures called osteons. 
So here's one osteon, here's another one, and this one is another great example of an osteon. So you could see that these osteons display concentric rings of bone, and these concentric rings are called lamellae. So I like to think of them as rings of a tree. The rings are called lamellae. And the lamellae encircle this canal called the central canal. And again, we said we have our neurovasculature in here. Now, when we look at spongy bone, this is going to look completely different. This is located on the interior portion of bone. And we see a lattice work structure, and it is strong and lightweight. So while this pink area is serving as bone, these other white areas are space. And the functions of our bones are to serve as levers for movement. It's also going to help to support our tissues. It's going to help protect vital organs like our cranium protects our brain. The thoracic cage protects our heart and our lungs. It's also going to store minerals like calcium and phosphorus. And we're going to be able to produce blood cells. And that we're going to call hemato uh, hemopoeic cells that go through hematopoiesis, which is the process of making blood cells. And here's another look at the actual bone histology slide. Here is an osteon, and we could see the black structures, the smaller black structures in here. These are serving as our osteocytes that live within their lacuna. And remember those rings are called lamellae, and the dark circle in the center is serving as the central canal where we have the neurovasculature. Now something I didn't talk about in the previous slide are these spider web like extensions that are coming off of the osteocyte. And these are called canaliculi, canaliculi. And that just means little canal. And these canaliculi allow those nutrients moving through the neurovasculature here to pass to the osteocytes. And then these osteocytes can connect to the canaliculi and pass more nutrients to their friends. And of course, we can pull the waste that they produce back to the central canal so those veins can carry the waste away. Now let's move into our last classification, which is the fluid connective tissue. We've got blood and lymph here. Our blood is going to be our fluid connective tissue with our formed elements, which our formed elements are our red blood cells or erythrocytes, which help to transport respiratory gases. Our leukocytes are our white blood cells, and they're going to protect against infectious agents. And lastly, our cellular fragments, which are called platelets, that help to clot blood. And if we were to take our blood and centrifuge it, meaning we're putting it in a test tube and spinning it around so fast that the components start to divide out, we would see that 45% of it are our red blood cells, which are the heaviest, so they're at the bottom. Then our thin white coat here is called a buffy coat, which is going to consist of our white blood cells and platelets, and they make up less than 1% of our total blood. And then the rest of this, 55% of it, is going to be our plasma, and that serves as our liquid ground substance. This is going to have dissolved proteins in it and help transport nutrients, waste, and hormones, but it's mostly made up of water. Now for um, these illustration, or this one's an illustration, but this one's an actual histology slide of blood. We could see the red cells here and here are serving as our red blood cells. And these larger purple-like cells are our white blood cells. And we have many different types that are listed here. We're going to discuss this all within our blood chapter. And these small fragments are our platelets that help with the blood clotting. Now for our lymph, that is actually derived from our blood plasma, and we're not going to have any cellular components or fragments here, and ultimately it'll be returned back into our bloodstream. And here's another look at our blood histology slide, the bigger cells being our neutrophils, 
or neutrophils, which are white blood cells. And we also have a lymphocyte here, which is another white blood cell. We have our platelet, which is a small fragment here. And all of these are serving as our red blood cells.